Good afternoon and welcome and thank you for giving up your lunch hour. Uh, welcome to participants, welcome to panelists. My name is Jill Helker. I'm the Director of International Cooperation and Partnerships and my job is really to fill in the time before we get to the substance. Um, we are against the clock so I will shorten my opening remarks um, and perhaps cut to the chase. Um, the point is that we want to illustrate uh, two key initiatives through which IOM is promoting a state-of-the-art understanding of contemporary migration dynamics to enable more informed policy responses and international cooperation on migration management. We have been collaborating with key partners with deep knowledge of migration issues and vast technical expertise over a number of years. Through partnerships, which is one of the keystones of the Director General's leadership, we're able to provide innovative tools and ideas to understand and address some of the most complex migration issues that we all face. As the first presentation will highlight, the World Economic Forum IOM Migration Transformation Map offers a unique way of presenting the drivers underpinning migration through an interactive and highly visual depiction of migration. We know from a lot of the work that we do that visuals make people understand things better than words. Uh, and so this is a very important tool, I think, for helping people really see and uh, therefore understand migration. So we're pleased that the World Economic Forum invited IOM to co-curate the migration map as part of its broader transformation map initiative. Our ongoing collaboration on the migration map will continue to enable users better to understand the complexities <laughs> of migration with greater ease. The second uh, presentation, set of presentations is on the syndicate. The panel will showcase the, world, the work of the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate, which IOM convened to provide the global compact process with the latest thinking on migration. The academic and applied researchers comprising the syndicate accepted our invitation to look closely at some of the particularly difficult areas in migration management, such as regular migration pathways or supporting people under the pressure to migrate. The publication we're launching today compiles contributions that not only unpack such issues, but also provide innovative ideas and practical recommendations to solve them. It's a pleasure to reinvigorate long-standing relationships with some of the academic partners who've been valuably assisting the international <laughs> community in identifying opportunities, challenges, and ways forward in migration management. It's also a great pleasure to continue expanding such collaboration to wider research and analysis circles from all over the world. Initiatives such as the Syndicate can benefit the international debate and policymaking on migration by adding perspectives that draw on substantive, empirical evidence and rigorous analysis and focus on wider perspectives, including those of migrants themselves. So I would now like to hand over to Jim and Mari to give their presentation on the transformation map. Over to you. Thank you, Jill, and, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to IOM uh, for inviting me to give you a, a brief presentation uh, of the forums uh, dynamic knowledge platform that we call transformation maps. Uh, before Mari turns specifically to the migration map uh, and uh, the relationships that it has uh, to other areas, um, let me give you a uh, brief introduction uh, of the platform so that you understand uh, the concept behind it and what we're trying to achieve uh, through it. Uh, in case any of you are, are not familiar with the forum, um, we, are, uh, we see ourselves as uh, helping to improve the state of the world by providing a global, independent, impartial, uh, future-oriented platform for global leaders to come together and shape the future. Uh, and we believe that evidence-based decision-making is really central uh, to that effort. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why over the past couple of years uh, we have developed uh, this dynamic uh, knowledge platform, the transformation maps, uh, we believe it's a, a powerful way to push that approach uh, forward. So with that in mind, let me start just by showing you a short video which should give you an idea about the maps and the concept behind them. How 
are migration, climate change and education connected? How will the fourth industrial revolution, social innovation and aging populations affect the future role of government? In an increasingly complex world, these connections can be hard to see, yet a systemic understanding of global issues is essential to today's leaders. As a global platform for multi-stakeholder cooperation, the World Economic Forum has developed a framework to analyze the interconnections among diverse topics, illustrating how developments in one area can impact others. By drawing on the collective intelligence of the forum's networks, transformation maps explain the factors driving change across industries, economies and global issues. For example, by disrupting every aspect of technology, the fourth industrial revolution will have a profound impact on governance and affect the scale and character of conflict. Both will test the role of government, which will also have to take into account the challenges posed by aging populations in advanced economies. Transformation maps cover more than 120 topics. Each topic is defined by its key issues, the most strategic trends shaping that topic. And because we're not looking at topics in isolation, but at systems in transformation, we highlight how issues depicted in other maps exert influence. The content is continuously updated by leading experts in the forum's extensive network. It is supplemented by a machine-curated feed of the latest research and analysis from leading universities and research institutions. And it is enhanced using technologies from fields such as machine learning, artificial intelligence and advanced network analytics. In an increasingly complex and interconnected world, transformation maps provide a unique contextual briefing to support more informed decision-making. So that gives you an idea about the maps and the, and the concept behind them. Um, we currently have 128 maps, and about 60% of those uh, have been co-curated with leading universities, <coughs> leading think tanks, and international organizations like uh, the International Organization on Migration. Um, to give you a flavor of, of the sorts of people that we work with, uh, some of the other examples of maps that would be broadly connected to, to the, the issue of migration would include the European Union that we did with the European Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the future of government that we did with the National University of Singapore, uh, humanitarian uh, action, which we did with UN OCHA, uh, human rights, which we did with the University of Oxford, uh, justice and legal infrastructure uh, that we did with the University of Southern California, uh, and Latin America and a whole host of Latin American <laughs> country maps uh, that we did with the Inter-American uh, Development Bank. So let me now try to demonstrate the, uh, the tool live for you so you can get a sense of how it works um, as, you, as you operate it. Um, I'm going to steer clear of migration uh, for the demonstration because uh, Mari's going to delve into that in, in a moment. Um, but for the purposes of the demonstration, um, imagine you were a, uh, a student or a government official uh, or a strategy officer in the private sector, and you wanted up-to-date information about the dynamics uh, around overfishing. Well, we have a map that we curated with the University of California, Santa Barbara, who are leaders in this field, who have, uh, amongst other key issues, identified overfishing as one of the key trends around this topic, and given us uh, some of the context for that. Uh, they've included some of the latest research around it uh, and some of the implications uh, that flow from it. Um, that key issue on overfishing in turn is connected to a number of other transformation maps in our system, uh, including uh, the map on the illicit economy, uh, which we curated with the Global Initiative Against Transnational and Organized Crime, uh, headquartered here in Geneva. And in that map, uh, among other things, you can learn how uh, criminal networks are profiting from natural resources, including fish, in a way uh, that threatens global biodiversity. Equally, um, you could approach overfishing from the perspective of governance, and you could consult uh, the map on global governance that we curated with the University of Oxford and understand some of the drivers of change around that particular topic. Again, you could take overfishing and look at it through the prism 
of innovation. And here you could consult a map that we curated with Nesta, which is an innovation foundation based in the UK. So you can see that there are lots of different ways that you can approach specific topics. Um, different ways to appreciate the interconnections and interdependencies that exist between all of these different subjects. And there are in fact thousands of different pathways that you could take between these subjects to understand the push and pull factors that exist between them. So we hope that the transformation maps which are designed to change and morph and adapt according to developments in the real world uh, help uh, to demystify some of the accelerating complexity that we're all faced with these days in understanding these relationships. Um, for each of the 128 areas, as mentioned uh, in the video, we have dynamic feeds of the latest research uh, and analysis, and we draw that at the moment from around 250 different sources around the world. And that's something we're always looking to increase, both in terms of number and quality, but also geographical representation, so that we're including different perspectives in terms of res research and analysis uh, in uh, the feeds that we provide uh, the users. Uh, the maps are obviously available in English, uh, but also the majority of content is also available in Arabic, Chinese, uh, Japanese, and Spanish at this point. Um, and we actually launched a public version of the transformation maps that contains everything I've just shown you um, a couple of weeks ago uh, in Dubai. So it's now uh, available free of charge to anyone who would like to access it, uh, we hope as a public good um, uh, from, from this moment on. Um, we are particularly proud of our, uh, our relationship uh, with IOM uh, in the co-curation of this migration transformation map. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the forum, I'd really like to thank Mari for being a, a steadfast pioneer in, in driving this forward. And she was, in fact, really uh, one of the first uh, international organizations to grasp this. And we've got no others on board now. Uh, so we've been very pleased with that uh, opportunity to collaborate. Um, I'll stop there, hand over to Mari, and she can take a closer look at the migration map. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, I am a fan, I'm an addict of the map. I get lost in it, as you could tell. It's quite, it can be quite engaging. But I'm coming at it from a practitioner. I'm a civil servant and I've been working in government since 1993 and in academia. So I see its applicability across a whole wide range of different areas, which we can talk about briefly. But firstly, I did want to uh, thank uh, Jim and Stefan, who's with us here today, for the opportunity to be collaborating on this. It's a really innovative and very useful tool. Uh, we thought that for the next few minutes I would take you through the map and also talk a little bit about how we can use it in our work because it's not just glitzy glam and the video is fantastic and it looks really good, but it's actually got a lot of utility and this is the thing that I was drawn to uh, and how we can use it in our work is really important. So the first thing to really notice about this map <laughs> compared to say some of the other maps, it's a pretty messy, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but, but we know that, and we've been hearing that in the last couple of days and at previous sessions on migration, migration it can be pretty messy. This is a global view. This is not intended to reflect regional dynamics around migration. It's not reflecting uh, national level dynamics. It is taking a very high level view. But in that way, it can be very useful for briefing. That's for sure. So let me just quickly, briefly take you through, if I can read it, and I will do my best, I'm sorry, <laughs> the key issues that we have put together in the centering that you can see there. So conflict and insecurity, I'll just very briefly read them out. Uh, then we've got the securitization and the breakdown of trust and the links to other maps there. Migration data and analytics, we've heard that a lot over the last sort of day and a half and we'll continue to hear that over the next few days. It's a burning issue for all of us working on migration. There's global governance and of course it's been a major theme in the context of the, um, the global compact uh, for migration and the discussions that we are having this week and next in Puerto Vallarta. Demographic trends is a very significant issue when it comes to migration and the first kind of forays into migration theory were by geographers and demographers. 
many years ago now. Integration, we heard the panel uh, earlier today on integration and how important that is continuing to be and perhaps even becoming more important. Maintaining migrants' rights, again, we've heard that a lot during the um, open debate in the interventions. It's a critical issue, including for member states, but also for practitioners working on migration. Inequality and uneven development, again, we've heard a lot about that in the last few days. Talent shortages, I will admit, is a little bit out there compared to the big drivers and the big factors, but part of that is the transition from having this migration map behind a, a password protected site for the World Economic Forum with their focus on industry leaders, government leaders, um, senior academics and so forth. So talent shortages was a natural fit then. It might transition into something slightly broader uh, into the future. Not to say that it's not important, but it's perhaps not as important for a broader audience. The outer ring I can't really read it, I'm sorry. I'm gonna try and do my best. The outer ring are all the other maps that this map links to. Cities and urbanization, which we just heard about in the previous panel, you can click onto, have a look at that one, which is Georgetown University, and see the enormous number of other maps and other issues that relate to it and how it connects to migration. One of the things to note, about the outer ring is the typology, which is expanding, set by the World Economic Forum, uh, limits us in terms of the geographic uh, regions that we can link into, whether that's countries or whether that's economic um, units and, and processes or whether that is actually geographic regions. So that is an area that will change over time as they expand, um, expand the series. It's not just interactive and it's not just an online tool. And this is where I think some of the utility lies uh, for briefing ministers who are coming into new portfolios for senior officials. There is this very useful briefing mechanism. You click on this button, download it, and it turns into a PDF, which can be saved. It's generated in real time. It can be printed can be emailed around and it provides the succinct synthesis sort of analysis of the key drivers and factors for whichever migration, uh, whichever map you're looking at, including the migration map. So this is the part where for those people who are not so tech savvy, you can actually provide something to them that they can read, take notes on and so forth. This is really where I think it's very useful for the work that we do within member states, uh, for the work that we do in international organisations because briefing senior officials who may come in or ministers who may not have a deep understanding of migration, they can derive enormous benefit in terms of looking at a succinct and synthesized briefing. Migration touches all of our lives and everybody feels connected to it. Everybody's got a story about migration, but we risk merging into anecdote rather than analysis quite often. So something like this briefing pack allows for a very useful synthesis discussion. It's the start of a discussion, it's not the end of a discussion, but it's a good intro and it's a good foray into it. Just by way of background, I uh, have worked for a long time in government for the Australian uh, <coughs> government and the immigration ministry. And in 2013 and 2014, over a two year period, we had five immigration ministers and I really wish I'd had this. <laughs> to start the conversation on <laughs> migration, international migration, the linkages, the complexities, and that it's not just a national level phenomenon because many politicians and many ministers tend to look at it through a domestic political lens, quite understandably, and this helps break that down. The other thing too, and I've worked in embassies overseas, and now that we're sitting in Geneva, the other way that I think it can be very, very useful, I'll go back to the map here, is when we work in missions overseas, and especially multilateral missions and busy UN missions, you have to be a lot across a lot of issues, whether you're covering climate change, you're dealing with human rights, you're dealing with a whole range of responses, including UN reform and so forth. This is actually quite useful for bringing and distilling that down into the different global transformations that we're all sort of grappling with. So you might be dealing with uh, overfishing, as Jim said. You've got a map there on, on oceans and the key issues around, uh, around overfishing. You might be dealing with climate change. There's one on climate change. There's cities <coughs> and urbanisation. There's 128. 
So it's a very, very useful tool for us in our work as we work in a multilateral environment and have to be across a whole range of different issues and introduce others to those issues in real time. So I would encourage you to have a play. Uh, it's not just um, interesting and you can get lost in it in terms of moving around the actual matrix. It does have the utility in terms of the briefing and I would welcome you and your feedback, particularly on the migration map, as we seek to expand and refine it over time. Thank you very much. So let me pick up from there. Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and thank you from me as well for taking time out of your lunch break. I'm Michelle Klein-Solomon, the director of the Global Compact for IOM, sitting in the office of the Director General, and it's really a pleasure to have all of you here with us and to have had the chance to hear from our colleagues at the World Economic Forum in Mari with this a truly innovative development. My part of the panel is to introduce you to the work of the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate, which is one of the initiatives we launched in connection with our efforts, particularly during the consultations phase of the development of the Global Compact, to really empower and get the voice of um, many different stakeholders. And here we felt that, um, you know, for the reasons that Jill said, uh, having a global compact for migration needs to be underpinned by the latest evidence, solid research, understanding, and really try to be uh, based on fact rather than myth. And it has been a tremendous pleasure working with Mari and her team, Inez in particular, to bring together 36 leading researchers in the migration field. And I'm particularly happy to have three of our stars here on the panel with us this afternoon. And I'm going to introduce them in just a moment and then turn to each of them. But let me say just a few words about the Research Leaders Syndicate. Um, we launched this in, in March, reached out to researchers throughout the world, and the key being to f bring people from various disciplines, law, geography, economics, demography, international relations, sociology, and political science, and from all different parts of the world so that we would have a truly uh, representative, balanced, and very diverse set of perspectives brought through the syndicate. And I have to say we were very successful with that and I'm quite proud. Congratulations, Mari and Inez in particular. So we have perspectives from researchers from countries of origin, transit destination, from every region of the world and from all the major disciplines that are relevant to migration governance. Um, the first thing that it, we also asked, uh, in addition to the 36 syndicate members, we decided to bring in sort of, um, I guess we call them policy advisors to provide a reality check. So people from more within the system, senior mi migration policy makers, practitioners, those who work in think tanks, to, to double check the ideas and do a bit of a reality check on what, what is being put forward. So we wanted to stimulate innovation and creativity and at the same time make sure that what was being generated really bore a relationship to reality and would be useful in the policy process. So the very first thing we did with, with all of these people is we asked each to identify their top three reads for policymakers, meaning if they were to recommend to policy meter, makers only three things that they could read in preparing for the Global Compact, what would they be? And each of them have provided us their top three reads. Some of them are, come from their own work. Some of them are the work of others. Some are blogs, some are academic articles, some are you know a whole host of different things. And those are actually all available now on the dedicated part of the IOM website for the Global Compact and specifically for the Migration Research Leadership. Can it? Uh, they are also available in this document which I hope many of see, I see is at the end of the table there and you can pick up, which is also available online if you don't want to take hard copies. But we also uh, decided to commission a series of 26 concise technical papers from several of the syndicate members and to bring them together in a workshop that took place here in Geneva at the end of September where they each produced very short 
policy-relevant documents focused on what we were already seeing through the Global Compact discussions as key policy conundrums for, for governments and for others. So we listened very carefully at the thematic consultations. We reviewed the chairman's summaries of each and listened to what we were hearing were coming up as some of the really difficult issues for the Global Compact and also based on the discussions that we have overall in IOM. And it was on those that we commissioned specific pieces, and then had the really wonderful opportunity to have two days together at the end of September for each to present, each author to present his or her contribution, and to have a live peer review, questions, comments, and went back to the authors. The results of that are those short papers in this document uh, addressing some of the key pol policy conundrums here. But more importantly than hearing from me, I think it'll be a great opportunity for you to hear from three, as I said, of our stars from the Research Leader Syndicate, who each wrote papers on different aspects and I think have very important things to say and to offer to our discourse. We ask them to be innovative, we ask them to be creative, but we also ask them to be grounded in reality and, and in what uh, is going forward here, but to challenge assumptions. And, and I think um, these three have done so particularly well, and I'm very happy to uh, present them in just a moment. Some of the contributions, just to give you a flavor for the kinds of issues that we asked the Research Leader Syndicate to address, things like conflicting issues of governance, governance in one area of migration, for example, on security, border management, versus facilitation and, and labor market demands and economic demands really raise challenging uh, issues for governments and how to reconcile the different aspects or layers of governance. Same about how to create regular legal migration pathways without creating um, a, a stimulus to more irregular migration. I mean, how do you get the balance right there in, in creating adequate pathways? How do you combat trafficking and smuggling and do it in a way that protects the rights of individuals but really gets at the criminal organizations? So a whole host of things around return, around integration, reintegration, some of the really um, pressing issues, and one that I found particularly interesting was about migration narratives and, and, and um, perceptions of migration. That one is not being presented this afternoon, but I'd really encourage you to take a look at it. It's a fascinating piece. And then we also brought in the private sector for a look at what's the private sector's interest in uh, migration and migration governance and in all of this. And, and as um, was said, that there's clearly links to be made here. The overall objective, not surprisingly, is to look at how to use these papers as a way for governments to think about putting in place policies that actually um, create more safe, orderly, and regular migration uh, or reduce obstacles and barriers to that, and at the same time don't inadvertently create more unsafe, disorderly, and irregular migration, which I think a lot of the policies that we see in place today are doing. So with that introduction, let me um, introduce our panelists today, and uh, first we'll go down this way, directly um, to my left, to your right, and start with Jorgen Carling. I'll introduce each of you very briefly first, and then and then turn to you. Jorgen is a research professor professor of migration and transnationalism studies at the at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. Um, some of you may be aware of some work that he put out, very, very challenging, uh, about definitions uh, about refugees and migrants and, and those questions, and look forward to hearing from Jorgen in just a moment. To his left is Lingeri Mbai, who's a research affiliate of the Institute of Labor Economics in Bonn, Germany, and also affiliated with the African Development Bank and has worked quite a bit in Senegal as well. And delighted to have you back with us, Lingeri. And finally, to her left is Binod Kadria. Good to see you again, Binod. He's a professor of economics and education at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and he's currently serving as the visiting chair of the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, Contemporary Indian Studies at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And some of you may recognize him because he was the thematic expert for uh, the th second thematic consultation on, was it the second or? 
Uh, second. 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 Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, on drivers and um, was uh, widely um, photographed and, and videotaped at the UN. So thanks, uh, Bino, for, for being part of this as well. Let me turn now to Jorgen for some explanation of your uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good science starts by asking good questions. And in migration research, let me see if we can get this. Uh, yes, in migration research, some of the key questions that have informed our work has been, what are the causes of migration and why do people migrate? And these seem to be straightforward and sensible questions, but they actually carry a risk of leading us down a blind alley. Because migration cannot really be reduced to a list of causes or a set of reasons. So instead, I ask, how does migration arise? And this is a question that allows for seeing migration as the outcome of a longer process with several steps, and also opens up to appreciating different types of outcomes beyond the dichotomy of either staying or going. We all lead our lives under certain conditions and with certain ideas about prospects for the future. Some people are poor, but see that life is slowly getting better. Others live in communities plagued by violence and fear that their situation is only getting worse. And some people are happy with their lives at the moment, but see that their livelihoods are disappearing as a consequence of economic or environmental change. So in short, it's the combination of current conditions and prospects for the future that determine whether or not people feel a need to take action and change the course of their lives. But an important part of this picture, especially in the context of development, is people's broader life aspirations. Because a way of life that could have seemed normal or, ex or uh, perfectly fine a generation ago might be dismissed by young people today as unacceptable. And these changes could happen more quickly too. For instance, when poor people are increasingly surrounded by wealth in their neighborhoods or in the media or via links with relatives who live elsewhere, it's natural that their life aspirations rise. And when people feel the need to take action and change the course of their lives, one possible outcome is that they develop migration aspirations. That means seeing migration as a promising pathway to a better, safer, or more prosperous future for themselves and their families. But this is just one possible outcome, because efforts to create a better future can take many forms. So for instance, millions of people invest in education as a pathway to safe employment. But others are recruited by insurgents or extremists who provide short-term income and a promise of changing the social order in the long term. So the point is that people's desire for change can be channeled in very different directions with very different consequences for the development process. And whether or not migration aspirations come up as a target for people's uh, efforts to create change in their lives depends partly on what we call migration infrastructure. And that's the totality of the different social networks, regulations, institutions, actors, and so on, that shape migration. And because this infrastructure varies so much, the possibility of migration is much more evident to people in some places than in other places. And these migration aspirations may or may not lead to actual migration. Um, And again the, migra sorry, again, the migration infrastructure is decisive for that step. So are there, for instance, provisions for regular migration? Are there smugglers who provide opportunities for an authorized migration? Is there a network of relatives overseas who can provide information and financial assistance, for instance? We know that for every national migrant in the world, there are about three other persons who would have wanted to migrate, but who don't have the means to do so. So what happens to them? Many pursue migration and fail. And of course, the ultimate form of failure is, is death. Thousands of migrants die in the attempt 
every year. And many more end up being apprehended and returned empty-handed. Others get stranded in places where they don't want to be, often under terrible circumstances. All these failed migration attempts come at a great loss to individuals, families, communities, and societies. The other widespread outcome is what we call involuntary immobility, wanting to leave but being unable to do so. And this can actually also be a costly outcome, because actual migration is a good thing for everyone, often. But when people spend years of their life hoping to leave and never succeeding, then everybody loses. And that's especially the case if the prospective migrants don't invest in, for instance, education or livelihoods or social capital that could have underpinned local futures. So what are the implications of all this? The framework that I've shown you is a starting point for thinking about the processes at work in specific contexts and about the possibilities for developing sound policies. But let me raise four more general points. First, the general picture that I've painted applies to both refugees and other migrants. Of course, the specific conditions and the specific prospects of the future are different. But there are very important overlaps, for instance, in the migration infrastructure and in the problems of failed migration and involuntary mobility. So the point is that we should be deliberate about where, how and when we make the distinction between refugees and other migrants. And the answers to those questions are not, I think, everywhere, always, and before any substantive discussions begin. Second, the gap between migration, migration aspirations and migration opportunities is a big challenge that we need to address. It's not easy to expand migration opportunities in today's climate. It's also not easy to lower people's migration aspirations. But the gap between the two is very costly. Third, we saw that the forces underlying the inspiration to migrate can also be challenged in very different directions and with disparate consequences for development. So for instance, if migration opportunities are cut off, what do people then do? Do they invest in education instead? Or do they riot? Those kinds of questions are really important. Finally, uh, the drivers of migration are not actually necessarily about poverty or insecurity today, but rather about a lack of faith in local futures. I would be very happy to see more migration than we see today. But in a world where migration opportunities will remain limited, we really depend on people believing in and investing in a future in their own societies as well. So I hope that I've given you some food for thought. Thanks a lot for listening and thank you to the IOM for providing such a wonderful opportunity for dialogue between research and policy. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgen. We're the ones who benefited from Good. your from your engagement and, and provocation and, and insight. Thank you. Very, very thoughtful. Um, let me turn immediately to Lynn Gary, because I do want to leave plenty of time for questions and comments from, from the audience. Lynn Gary, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you to IMM for the invitation and for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk about ways to support communities under migration pressure, and I'm going to particularly focus on the role of opportunities, information to potential migrants, and resilience to shocks. So, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So, if we talk about having migration, uh, uh, a sort of migration which is safe, orderly, and regular. We need to understand what drives migration at the first place and why it is important to, to support these sedentary communities. So according to Gallup poll survey, between 2013 and 2016, 14% of world population uh, was willing to migrate permanently to another country. And uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa had the highest rate, 31%. But then de facto, this means that most of the people are not willing to migrate permanently to another country, right? So 86% are willing to stay in their origin country, and for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 69%. So 
supporting people who are willing to stay in their origin countries may be a complex issue because there is not a single migration driver. You have different type of causes, and, and uh, Jorgen mentioned it earlier. And also migration pressure can be similar um, if we compare regions who are, for example, politically stable and regions who are politically unstable. If I refer to the same survey, they show that in the same uh, period of time, um, there were 22% of people from Middle East who were willing to migrate permanently, and this was, uh, I mean, this share was 21% in European Union. So this is a complex issue. And of course, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, later, the best way to support sedentary community is not necessarily to prevent them from migrating, because what we want is a safe migration. And so it's important to provide these people with options and choices, so they don't just have to take up on risky uh, uh, attempt to migrate. Yeah. So there is a conventional wisdom that poverty reduction would reduce migration. But according to the evidence that we have, it will not necessarily be the case. For poor countries, the, the evidence that we have shows that in the first stage of development, actually poverty reduction would increase migration. And once these poor countries reach the status of upper middle income countries or rich countries, then migration will start decreasing. Why? Because people, they just have, they are less um, uh, constrained financially. So they release their liquidity constraint and they can afford migration costs. And they also have more aspirations, more expectations. And then once they are comfortable enough, so they, they reach the level of, of upper middle income uh, uh, countries or um, high uh, income countries, then migration will start decreasing. Um, so there is this non-linearity between poverty reduction and migration issues. And then it means that we need to look at other causes, other issues that may drive the, the migration pressure than, than poverty reduction. So of course, I'm, I'm not saying that we should not reduce poverty, but what I'm saying is that we have to reduce poverty no matter its effect on migration. Um, so the first thing I want to look at is the expectations. Migrants' expectations. So I made a survey in Senegal comparing potential legal and illegal migrants, and it appeared that actually high expectations are correlated with high willingness um, to migrate illegally. That's the first thing. So there is a, a, a positive correlation between expectation and illegal migration. And um, the second thing is that these expectations most of the time are very, they are biased. And I give you a, a very simple example. The average um, expected income for these potential illegal migrants was 1,700 euros. And if I compare that figure to the average income um, in Spain, for example, at that time, because Spain was the favorite uh, destination country, so for a migrant outside European Union, it was less than 500 euros. So these expectations are very high and biased and kind of far from the reality. But then what, dr what drives these expectations, how these expectations are formed, and that's the... the uh, where the migrants' relatives' networks uh, are at play. So most of these expectations are based on what these potential migrants think about the earnings or the living conditions of their relative who have successfully migrated. That's the first thing. And so I just want to remind you the, com the context. So here we are talking about migrants living in a country which, are, which is politically stable, so there is no civil conflict. And then you have 77% of these people that I interviewed, they are willing to take, uh, to, to accept risking their life. And then half of them, uh, once they say, okay, I am willing to, to take a risk, I am willing to, to, to accept a, a risk of dying. And half of them are willing to accept a risk of death, which is equal or higher to 25%, which is huge. So what does this tell us? It tells us that first of all, they are aware of the risk that they are taking. And second, there is a large utility gap between remaining in their origin country and, and migrating. And what I'm saying is that these migrants' networks, they provide good information. They will provide information on the way to fund the migration, on job opportunities, for example, the way to cross borders, and so on. But at the same time, they may, they may not talk about their living conditions, just remain silent, 
or maybe just by their behavior when they get back home, they can make people think that they have very good living conditions, that you know, the salary is extremely high, that they are very comfortable, which can be true, but which can also be uh, not true. Right? And these, these are things that shapes this type of expectations. So we, we need to look at also the role of uh, networks and relatives um, in the economy of their origin countries. At a micro level, migrants, they, they can really have an, a, a true economic power through their remittances. So if I take the extreme case of Tajikistan, where migrants' remittances represent more than 40% of the GDP, that's, that's huge. In countries like Liberia, it's 26%. In Senegal, it's almost 11% of GDP. At a micro level, you will have in rural and urban areas, um, household with good living condition, good status, social status, often have migrants in their household that can provide them with, uh, with you know, access to education, health, and so on. So yeah, so this is the, the, the point. I mean, I mean, in this case, um, if you have in your community like migrants who are the one who, let's say, have good living condition or are successful according to your definition of being successful, then it, it, it can just seem that migration is for you the only way of succeeding, actually, or having a social existence in your community. Oh, okay, too fast. Yeah, and the last point is, is really related to the role of adverse shock. So we have also one of these myths that, okay, climate change will drive migration or natural disaster would necessarily increase migration. And we know now that this is a very complex issue. It's not that straightforward. So for natural disasters or environmental shocks to drive migration, there are certain conditions. So first of all, people, um, I mean, people will migrate if they all, all other options, all other survival strategy have failed, so they, they don't have any, any more options. The second, if you have these intense and very short-term sudden shocks, such as flood or storm, for example, that leave no space, then you would have to move, even if you don't move too far because you can't just afford the cost of migration. And third, and it's related to the second point, people need to be able to afford the migration costs and, and not have any liquidity constraint that will allow, uh, um, allow them to migrate in, in case of adverse shocks. So just way to move forward. I mean, again, the, the message here is really not to prevent migration. It's just make migration one option among other and provide to people a set of choices. So the first thing, it's extremely important above all for young people to have opportunities in their home countries. And this means supporting the labor market environment. In most of the studies we, we can, uh, and, and the figures that we have, you can see that the unemployment rate, for example, is much lower than the unemployment rate. So people, maybe they, may, they can be at work, but then the work that they have is not good enough. They don't have good jobs that would provide them with decent living conditions um, that are safe, that are sustainable. That's the first thing. So it's important to create incentives and, and favorable conditions. So the second is that we, if we talk about you know, innovation, we could use um, ICT, and I give the example of mobile phones, but not only, because these are kind of very cheap now, accessible to people, and it helps. I mean, evidence shows that it helps connecting not only people, but also services and markets. Uh, you have the example of Impesa, which really help uh, communities to be financially included and indirectly also have some social inclusion. But just to go beyond maybe the role of mobile phones, it would be also um, interesting to use technology to, to demonstrate um, success in areas such as agriculture. And just reshape the narratives, give alternative narratives of success, and show, showcase um, role models who succeeded at home, like as a reference point. If your only reference point, and that's why I talk about relative concern, is of success, is a migrant, then you, know, you tend to think that there is only one way, actually. And then this would also help reshaping expectations. Yeah. I talked about the, the quality of the, the information that is, that, that is delivered to potential migrants. It's extremely important that we design effective tools to improve the quality of information. 
Um, so it can sound a bit contradictory. <laughs> I talked about mobile phone and use of technology in a globalized world. To, to think that people are misleaded about what to expect from their migration uh, experience. But it's, it's not if we look at the filter to, through which they receive the information. And most of the time, they will tend to trust more the relatives, the people they know that they, are, they, they grow up with, than the official source of information, for example. And finally, it's, uh, it's very important. I mean, I don't need, I think, to convince anyone to build resilience to shock, not only after the shock, but also before the shocks, with really strengthening the, the social protection mechanism in, in developing countries, because this is really a, a big issue, but also diversifying the economy. Most of these economies that migrants come from in, in Africa, um, these are agrarian societies. So we really need to work on the structural transformation, because that's where the good, the good jobs jobs come from. Right. Thank you. And I stop there. Thank you very much, Lynn Gary, for that very, very interesting analysis. And I'm struck in particular by the links between the two presentations and really looking at um, migration is a matter of choice and people having an opportunity to migrate in a safe and legal way, but not being compelled to do so. And that, that was a strong message that underpinned both of your presentations. Let me turn now to Binod for our final presentation this afternoon. Uh, can I have that thing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, uh, Michelle. Um, well, uh, Speaking at the end has its own advantages and disadvantages. I will turn it, try to turn it to my advantage. Um, I think this particular session is innovative in the sense that it begins with the name innovation. Innovation and ideas on international cooperation. I think it is very contextual after what the president, honorable president of the General Assembly, the Secretary General, special representative, and the Director General of IOM, mentioned yesterday that there are gaps, there are, we, we cannot be complacent about, and we have to really get going. So in that context, the, what you mentioned as a background uh, of these attempts by the syndicate to come out with narratives, uh, blogs, and of course, conundrums. Um, when we come to conundrums, I think that there are three kinds of conundrums. Uh, I tend to put them as micro level at the individual level, um, meso level, that is the community level, and the macro, which is the national level. Uh, my colleagues here, you have already heard them, and I think Georgian has addressed the conundrum at the micro level, individual level mainly, uh, in the context of what he says failed migration uh, or involuntary immobility. And when it comes to Lingeri's presentation, I think it is about voluntary immobility uh, of communities, which is at the meso level. So my task is to uh, complete the circle by addressing the macro level, which is at the national level. Uh, so let me begin by posing a question before you. Um, at the national level, what is common to these Phenomenon. These are well-known um, incidents or developments uh, in the recent times. Brexit, European refugee crisis, Scotland referendum, U.S. travel ban, Catalonia referendum, Mexico wall, Australian boat people, Bangladeshis in India, Myanmar, Rohingya expulsion. Of course, they are all connected with migration. But to my mind, what is common uh, in the context of this session is um, their all inequitable products of unilateralism in international migration. Un unilateral in the sense that um, the countries which have taken these decisions have hardly consulted the counterpart, uh, you know, stakeholders. So, why did this happen? Uh, why didn't the idea of equitable adversity analysis uh, didn't work? Why did, why did it not work? And this is an idea, equitable adversity analysis, that I have been vouching for almost a decade uh, in the sense that uh, countries, 
destination and origin countries step into each other's shoes. And that's how uh, you know, my paper is called In Each Other's Shoes, Making Migration Policies Equitable Across Borders. It took me almost a decade to realize that this is not working. And so I was thinking, why? Was it an utopia? Uh, perhaps not. Uh, was then my assumption of nations engaging in serious multilateralism too strong to be realistic? And I think that was particularly the reason. Uh, because it is a conundrum. And that's what Michel mentioned, that we are um, thinking of conundrum. This is a new concept, new term that IOM has taken an initiative to bring to the focus. And I was looking at what does it mean. It means uh, multilateralism is what I'm addressing. So it means a modern day maze we come across many kinds of maze, so there's nothing unusual about that. It's a logical postulate, which is a positive thing, but yet an intricate and difficult problem that evades easy solution. So my concern is multilateralism is a conundrum. It doesn't have easy and uh, you know comfortable solutions. As an evidence from the past, I I'm tempted to address or, or bring to notice what is called the GCIM, Global Commission on International Migration. Yesterday, uh, Director General uh, Swing had mentioned about Kofi Annan's contribution. One of the contributions that he did not mention was GCIM. He mentioned uh, GFMD and others. But GCIM, Global Commission on International Migration, was set up in 2002 for a limited period of three years, and one of the important recommendations of that report in 2005 was not to make distinction between highly skilled and low skilled migrant workers. Uh, so that was accepted, but within six years, as you can see, this report is of 2011 from the UN. You look at the four sets of bars. They are all countries, developed, more developed countries, less developed countries, and least developed countries. And these are percentage figures, as you can see, that there has been a massive rise in the selectivity of countries, of groups of countries, not only developed countries, destination countries, but also the least developed countries, because they were all destination countries. There was not much of a role to play in this by the origin countries. And that's why I call it, it was unilaterally adopted selective policies favoring high skill immigrants. Now, from past to the future, if we look at this, this selectivity, to my mind, is now further deepening uh, from labor market to the education market for accumulation of what is called STEM human capital. STEM stands for scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. And there is what is called a global war for talent. I'm tempted to share this diagram with you, particularly because Mary had liked this one wanted me to share this, so I'm bringing this. If you look at the first two uh, circles, you find that you know most of the professional workers are coming directly into the labor market from abroad, but only uh, a small proportion of students, overseas students, enter into the labor market in the destination country. That was pre-1991. But if you look at 1991 to 2001 phase, then you see an overlap, H-1B visa, and you know, both in the labor market and in the education market, and you see that education market is expanding, and phase three, OPT extension, and so on, so the overlap is more or less half and half. And then this is a, some kind of a projection of 2016 to 30, which is sustainable development goal period, as well as the compact period projected, and that's when uh, it is my, <clears throat> my kind of a, you know, hunch that education, overseas education, would be main driving force of high skill migration, because more 60 to 80 percent of the, uh, you know, tertiary level students continue to stay in the countries where they have their education, and that might go up. So this is some kind of a prophecy. Now, <clears throat> coming back to the um, issue of unilateralism, uh, the problem that I uh, look at in terms of destination countries uh, taking decisions in isolation uh, are threefold. Uh, and they are based on 
internal contradictions and consistencies within the countries. Because countries now we find are not this, you know, exclusively divided as origin countries and destination countries. They are both. They are also transit countries. Same country is an origin country, a destination country, and a transit country. And that's where we find that their policies, their decisions are often contradictory to each other when they are, you know, sitting in one kind of decision, say, uh, as immigration country than as compared as, a, uh, as an immigration country. And what are, what are the implications? If you look at the three bars, that three arrows, so to say, are uh, migration turbulence in mobility trends. If you look at the trends, long-term trends, we find that there are ups and downs, you know, massive ups and downs. This is one of the reasons. Secondly, we find micro-macro divide on stability in mobility decisions. See, individuals and families take long-term migration decisions, whereas countries take short-term migration decisions. And that, I think, is contradictory. Mm, and family decisions, individual decisions in terms of career choice, education choice in terms of through uh, labor market signals uh, are actually non-reversible. They are one-way street, whereas countries retract their positions uh, from opening the labor market to closing the doors. And finally, what is important is <clears throat> something to introspect by the governments themselves is that their policymakers, the legislators, as well as the bureaucrats who uh, actually implement the policies, they do not go back home uh, happy as happy people. Their FGF means feel good factor. <laughs> their FGF is actually very, very low. I could see that yesterday in the crowd here, some people were quite sounding quite dis unhappy and disappointed when uh, the uh, president and the DG were saying we need structural change. Finally, uh, I let me so let me just come back to my come to my recommendations. Now, maps are very interesting. I like maps, so that's how this session began with. I also like diagrams, and I sh I showed you some diagrams, but diagrams take a long time. Acronyms are short, they don't take much time. And they also create, you know, arouse curiosity. And that's why we remember the acronyms. If you go to Singapore, everything is in acronym. So my recommendations are, first recommendation that, you see, we talk about multilateralism, but we practice unilateralism. So why not put the entire onus on unit, unit, utility, uh, sorry, unitarianism? Regime by the de destination countries in global north as well as the global south, GN and GS. So that I think, I'm, I'm drawing this, this kind of a lesson from actually the difference between Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. One major difference is that Millennium Development Goal, the entire onus was only on developing countries. Whereas Sustainable Development Goals, the, country, the, the onus is shared between developed and developing countries. And this is where I think we should, uh, we should be, you know, be more realistic. So for this, I uh, recommend two strategies. One I call IDC and for TCD and South-South Cooperation. Now what is IDC for TCD? See, we talk about diaspora for development, for homeland development, but this, I think, has been our obsession. Why can't we go beyond homeland development? I think we should also have what is called inter-diaspora cooperation. If there are Chinese and there are Indians, they can also shake hands and, you know, go to an Ebola-affected country in, 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 in the least developed part of the world. That would be third country development. TCD is for third country development, not the homeland development. Similarly, we can, the, my, my second strategy is about north-south cooperation. That's where I think the global war for talent needs to be addressed. And that's where the STEM perhaps can be recognized as a global, as part of the global commons. There are only five or six global commons so far, but perhaps well, human capital should be added as a global common, and that's where the north-south cooperation could be for temporary return rather than temporary migration. Because if dual citizenship is given, then people can come back without fear of re, uh, not of being denied the re-entry permissions. And why I say this, because, see, there used to be a program called Talk 10 uh, some time back, 
and that was for sharing the people back with the country of origin. But what I am trying to derive is, say, UN peacekeeping force. We are in the, un we are in the premises of the UN. Why can't we have a UN healthkeeping force? For example, we, ha we are short of doctors and nurses and so on. We can share them. They, can, they go home every year. One vacation, they can go to a, a third country and you know, maybe stay three months without interference of the family and friends and deliver uh, service. Well, these are innovative ideas. They may sound utopian, but perhaps we need to work on them. I also would like to say that there are three preconditions that we need to address, and these are neglected issues. Um, these are all related to visa issues. Now, I find that in international migration discourse, we tend to skirt, you know, we, we, um, in the name of sovereignty, we do not address visa issues. And that I think we need to address. And I'm going to conclude very soon. One is, I call it dementia in the consular practices. You go to ask for a visa, you have to give same documents, same papers again and again and again and again. We talk of, you know, memories, computer memories of, you know, gigabytes and so on, but consulates have no memory. They suffer from dementia. So, and it is environmental unfriendly because the paper means we are cutting our trees. Second is, you know, we don't know when the visa policy is going to change. One year, after one year, after two days, after five years, three weeks. But decisions, family decisions, individual decisions get affected by that. So I, I propose that there should be a best before date on the visa policy change so that I can plan Short of a crisis, it will not be changed by the country. That is also perhaps a utopia today. And thirdly, of course, this is very important. I think it has been emphasized from yesterday and today also, statistics, data. Now, there is a great deal of confusion about migration data understanding. You know, the simplest confusion that I find amongst our decision makers and bureaucracies is the difference between stock data and flow data. You know, I tend to hear the stock is growing. You know, this is alarming. That <laughs> stock will grow. But if the flow grows, then I, I should be alerted. I think that data literacy is very important. And that's why I say save migration statistics from becoming lies and damn lies. Short of this, migration will continue to be driven by conundrums of multilateral pretensions, I call them. Multilateral pretensions of three S. These are sovereignty, security, and social cohesion. I think we have addressed these three issues long enough, but I think we actually have not put our finger into it. We are just beating around the bush. Thank you very much. So thank you, Binad, for not only being innovative, but being very funny and stimulating, entertaining. Thank you very much. Wonderful things to think about. Let me open the floor for questions, comments to any of our, our panelists. And since we've encouraged you to leave your placards behind, uh, when you take the floor, could you please introduce yourself since you're not sitting next to something? Is that uh, somebody in the very back who would like to speak? Yes, please. Uh, you have the floor. Please introduce yourself. I'm from Zaina Mohanna from Amal Association International. Uh, thank you so much for very interesting um, uh, talks. I'd like just to stress with uh, Dr. Mbai uh, intervention related to poverty reduction that it doesn't effectively reduce migration. I'd like to know more because we did our observation uh, uh, for the migration cycle since, uh, from Southeast Asia and Africa to Lebanon, specifically to migrant domestic workers and effectively the points of the um, government as much as what we see from uh, challenges that are faced by migrant domestic workers is that effectively if they are provided job opportunities where their culture is preserved, definitely they would uh, be happier staying at home. So I'd like just to hear more about from where this assumption of poverty reduction does increase migrations coming from. Are there any empirical data? Uh, is it applying to uh, middle and highly skilled uh, migrants or uh, lower skilled also? And is, if this is based on any geographical uh, component. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Zaina. Let me see if there are other questions or comments in the interest of time, and then we can turn to the panelists um, collectively. Would anybody else like to pose a question, make a comment, challenge something that's been said? Offer a different perspective. Yes, I see also in the very back row, but on the other side. If you could uh, introduce yourself, please. Uh, hello, my name is Marina Martinenko. I represent World YMCA. And the question is about the map, as we find it a very, very important and useful tool, and we would like to share it within the YMCA's, the national locals all around the world. And our question was, uh, how often is the map updated and based on what sources it is updated? Thank you. Thank you. Great, very specific questions. Uh, and I'll come back to you in a moment for the answers to those. Would anybody else like to take the floor? Questions or comments or challenge to what any of the speakers have said? Since I don't see any right now, maybe perhaps we could turn to Jim first about that last question in the specifics of the migration transformation map. Thank you. So uh, in answer to your question as to how often they are updated, um, the answer is constantly. Um, we work with co-curators um, externally, like Marie, um, and also teams in-house to make sure that the, the key trends that they represent across the 128 different areas and the interconnections between them uh, reflect what is actually happening in the world. Um, at a very minimum, we ask uh, the people we work with to revisit the content they provided us um, every three months or so. Um, but of course, there are developments in the world uh, that would require immediate reflection in the maps, whether it's a, a, a peace agreement in Colombia or a Brexit vote or something of that nature, we would want that to be included uh, very quickly uh, uh, indeed. Um, we are constantly looking at ways to try to, try to find ways of updating things that don't rise to the level of a key trend. So something, for instance, uh, a synthesis of some interesting analysis that's come out that we could perhaps take from some of the research and analysis featured in our feed. That's something we're playing with at the moment uh, so that our users have a sense uh, not only of the key trends, but the thinking around those trends as it develops. And so we want to constantly test ourselves to see whether we can provide a better service that way. And just. Just to add very quickly, for those who are interested in accessing the maps, we just put up on the screen the, the shortened address that you can, you can access them through. Um, again, open to all the public now. Thanks. Um, just to add, in terms of the migration maps specifically, uh, we look at key data, key statistics, and, and when it is released, such as displacement statistics from UNHCR, IDMC data, new reports that come out, so we've got that all sort of scheduled. There's uh, a DESA revision on international migrant stock coming out uh, uh, next year, I understand, so we'll be updating the data there. Also in regards to the Global Compact, it's a critical issue, particularly in regards to global governance of migration. So. We did look at it uh, before it was launched publicly in Dubai and had a sweep through to see if there was anything that needed updating. We decided not to, but I will be doing one in a couple of weeks after we launch World Migration Report <laughs> tomorrow. So I held it off for that and to, because then we've got a lot of data, a lot of information that is pulled together that will be quite useful for working its way through into the uh, migration transformation map. But it's an ongoing process and as Jim said, we do... Uh, revise it. We revise it for key events such as the public launch and, and any summit that uh, WEF might be doing, a MENA summit or something. But we also do it just very regularly and tied into new release, newly released data. Thank you both, uh, Jim and Mari, and that's great to hear. I wish most data and <laughs> analysis were updated that regularly. It's not generally the case. I know that uh, BNOD has to leave us. So um, I know, Lingari, you were posed a particular question, but I want to offer BNOD any last thoughts before he has to leave and then turn to Lingari and then offer you, Jorgen, any final thoughts as well. 
I think these are challenging times for us, but at the same time, uh, it is an opportunity. Uh, if we lose this opportunity, uh, I think that would be, you know, unfortunate. That would be like missing the bus. And I don't want to miss my plane. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us and staying to the bitter end when he has to rush to the airport. Safe travels. Lynn Gary. Thank you for the question. Um, so about the poverty reduction issue. So this has been, uh, uh, there are two studies, particularly one qualitative, one quantitative. I'm going to talk about the quantitative one by Michael Clements from the Center of G for Global Development. And basically, so what he's showing is that the relationship is not linear, which means that it's not like you increase poverty and migration would decrease. It doesn't work like that. And he takes the sample of poor countries. These are low income countries, so very poor countries. And for these countries in the first stage, actually when you decrease poverty, indeed migration increase. And then there is a threshold which is estimated at 6, 000, between 6,000 and 8,000 US dollars. And once these countries per habitant reach this level of income, then development will start reducing migration. So the relationship is not just a linear one. At some point, indeed, poverty would reduce migration, but not in the first stage of the development process for poor countries. And it makes sense if you think that migration is a costly project. People need to be, um, I mean, liquidity constraints prevent most of the people from migrating. And Jorgen mentioned it earlier in his presentation. You, even if you are aspiring to migrate, you want to migrate, you need to be able to afford it. And then once you are comfortable enough in your home countries, then you don't have to migrate anymore because all your aspiration can be fulfilled without migrating. Um, yeah, and I also, because you mentioned opportunities, I also want to make difference between poverty and job opportunities. These are two different things. That's why also in my recommendation, I, I was talking about creating opportunities, right? And what do I mean by job opportunities? As I said, if you look at the figures, unemployment rate are kind of, they are much, um, uh, how do you say, okay, underemployment rate are much higher than unemployment rate. So most of the people actually, they are at work, right? But the issue is that they are in vulnerable condition. They do not have what we call the good jobs that provide them with good living condition, uh, um, jobs that are sustainable, you know, that are not in the informal sectors and so on. So I would make the difference between job opportunities and poverty. I think these are two different things. And finally, um, about the skilled issue, uh, who is affected. Um, I made myself a study on, which is, which is another topic, on climate change, natural disasters, and migration by making the difference between uh, low skilled people, middle skilled people, and high skilled people. So who migrate when natural disasters, mainly caused by climate change, happen? And what I found out is that indeed there is a positive relationship. However, if you dig a little bit, you would see that only the high skilled people would migrate. So low skilled people and middle skilled people do not migrate again. And it just kind of also uh, strengthened the hypothesis that people, because skills is uh, correlated with income, right? So high skilled people in poor countries, they are probably the, the one who are also the wealthier one. And it corroborates the issue of liquidity constraint, right? When a shock happen, you may want to migrate, but you, you will have to, to be able to afford the shock. And what we see is that when you have shocks like storms and floods that doesn't leave really space, you have to go. People, they tend to go not, not so far because they just can't afford the migration cost to move in, a, in, a, in another country. And I stop there. Thank you. Excellent uh, answer, Lingari. And let me put in a plug on behalf of Mari <laughs> for tomorrow's release of the World Migration Report. A teaser here, page 156, actually has a graph of, of referring to the study that Lingari just mentioned by Michael Clemens from the Center for Global Development. And it's called the Mobility Transition, looking at precisely what Lingari just said. So plug for tomorrow's release of the World Migration Report. Stay tuned for page 156. And um, let me turn over to Jorgen for the final word. Thank you very much. 
I'm I'm very glad that this point about poverty reduction came up because it's it is such a central part of the bigger issue around migration and development and policy interventions, and uh, of course it raises the question of so what then do we do about development aid? Where should it be directed? And I think it's a bit uh, of a concern at the moment to see that there is a pressure to take development aid out of the countries where migration is not a big concern and shift it to countries that we are worried about because they have people who want to come to the donor countries. So from European perspective, there is a strong incentive to shift aid, say, from Central and Southern Africa towards West Africa, which is a much bigger migration concern for Europe. But we know that development aid is very, very difficult. Converting money into, into sustained social and economic development is, is a huge challenge. So I think the main lesson to be learned is that we should spend development funding where it really works. Um, and by taking it to the areas where migration issues are the greatest, we might risk a sort of double failure in the sense that it's not really alleviating the migration pressures, but it's leading to a lower return in terms of development outcomes for every dollar spent on development. But having said that, of course, we should also work in countries with strong immigration pressures to create opportunities and to create faith in, in local futures, as I mentioned. So it, the risk is this sort of simple connection between thinking that putting money in to alleviate poverty will reduce uh, migration pressures. Probably they won't, and probably that money might be better spent in other ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorgen, um, and to all of you, because I think you've done exactly what we had hoped to achieve in launching the Migration Research Leaders Syndicate, was precisely to look at some of the myths, look at some of the conundrums, and really debunk some of the assumptions around these issues so that policy can ma making can be better informed. As Gary said, it's a good idea to reduce poverty, period. Yes. <laughs> uh, whether that actually reduces the pressure for migration is a different question, but um, p p government should not have false expectations on that. So thanks to both of you from the Research Leader Syndicate, and we look forward to continuing with you. And thanks so much on this side of the podium to Jim, Jill, Mari, the ladies in red, and uh, um, for what is really truly an exciting collaboration and something that we are very committed to as IOM. And thanks to all of you for staying with us for this period, and uh, glad we'll give you at least five minutes break before the next session. Thank you.